his, his talk. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. <clears throat> It was interesting to hear Ambassador Ford talk about the U.S. role in the world and Donald Trump. I guess I'm the only American on this panel, and so I bear some of the blame for what's going on, although I've tried to do everything I can to prevent it. Um, back in 2012, the filmmaker Oliver Stone and I released our documentary film series and first of our series of books called The Untold History of the United States, which was a history of the American empire and national security state. And we wanted a, well, I, I knew the answer already, but Oliver was trying to figure out when we had dinner in 2007, whether George Bush was an anomaly whether George Bush was something exceptional in the American tradition or whether he was consistent with patterns that had developed over the long run. And my view, of course, was that George Bush was a more egregious example of America's wrongdoing in the world that had gone on at least since the start of the American empire. So we explored this and we began our study with the Spanish-American War, uh, it, and, and especially the U.S. intervention against the popular Aguinaldo forces in the Philippines. And the United States, you know, we, we debated where to start, because we could start with the colonization of the United States by the British. We could start with the genocide of the Native Americans. We can start with the introduction of slavery. America, many people consider America's original sin. But we decided we would start with the 18, 1898 and the rise of the American empire. And then the United States becoming the world's leading counter-revolutionary force. Well, in some ways, as Ambassador Ford said, we did learn from the British. But we also learned some negative lessons from the British, because the United States did not want to have a colonial empire the United States wanted to have a, what we call the open door empire. The United States realized that we didn't have to put troops everywhere, at least back then, in order to maintain domination, the goals of which were access to cheap labor, access to the world's resources, and access to the world's markets. Because the crisis of the 1890s, the 1893 depression, the United States debated there were two ways to get out of the 1893 depression because it was a depression based on overproduction. So you can get out of that either by increasing domestic consumption, raising the standard of living of workers at home, or you can get out of it by trading, finding overseas markets to get rid of your surplus goods. Of course, given the st class structure of the United States in the 1890s, they opted for overseas markets to deal with America's crisis of overproduction. And that pattern consisted in the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, with intervention after intervention into Latin America. But the real history of the American empire, as we know it now, begins with World War II, and begins with the fundamental myths of World War II. And there are three fundamental myths that I like to talk about. The first is that the United States won the war in Europe. If you ask Americans who won the war in Europe, they'll say the United States did, with some assistance from the British. Uh, and that's what Americans believe. And they're very, very ignorant about the history. I did a survey, an anonymous survey, of college undergraduates. And I asked them how many Americans died in World War II. And the median answer I got was, was 90,000 which meant they were only 300,000 off. That's at least in the ballpark. I asked them how many Soviets died in World War II. The median answer I got was 100,000, which means they were only 27 million off, which means that these kids 
A students, college educated, had no idea what the Cold War was about, no idea at all what Ukraine is about, no idea what's going on in the world. And, and, and so we're dealing with a crisis of ignorance in part. And when you have a crisis of that depth of ignorance, then you're going to have a crisis in a lot of other areas. And that's what we're seeing now. The Americans, Ambassador Ford mentioned American exceptionalism. Well, he's right. That is America's abiding sickness. And it goes back to World War II, to our, the victory over fascism, which the Americans claim for themselves. It goes back to World War II and the other myths, which we'll get to in a second. This idea that the United States is not only different from everybody else, but the United States is better than everybody else. That all other countries are out for territorial aggrandizement, for increasing wealth, for geopolitical domination, motivated by greed and desire for power. But the United States is different. The United States wants to spread freedom and democracy. The United States is benevolent. It's altruistic. It only wants to do good in the world. And that seems crazy to you, of course, but that's what most Americans believe. And most Americans believe and accept that uncritically. And they're taught that from the earliest days of watching television. Of, I mean, this, this notion is so sick and pervasive. You can turn on the American television networks, especially more liberal networks like MSNBC or CNN, and they'll have a panel of experts and it could be experts about Syria, or Iran, or North Korea, or Russia. And, they'll, they'll, and every one of them will call for sanctions against Russia and saying that Russia's interference in the 2016 election was an act of war. They all refer to it as an act of war. And you wonder, you're watching this, you say, what, what hole did these people crawl out of? To say that Russia's interference in the U.S. election was an act of war, and to not put in the context of the U.S. interfering in every election, everywhere, at least since 1947, since the rise of the establishment of the CIA, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling to see that. But that's the reality that you live in in the United States. So we don't know anything about the U.S. intervention in the 2008 election in Russia how when uh, Boris Putin was polling in single digits, the U.S. experts went in there and salvaged the election for Putin. I mean, there's just no context for understanding anything that's going on in the world, which makes the United States that much more dangerous, because it's incapable of self-reflection. So this idea, so we begin with the myth about World War II and the Americans winning the war in Europe. And we go to the question about winning the war in Asia. Now, the, the significance of that is that most Americans believe that World War II ended. It's what Obama said. When Obama went to Hiroshima in May of, May of uh, 2016, I was brought over there. I go, to, I go to Hiroshima a lot. I take students on a study abroad trip to Hiroshima and Nagasaki every summer since 1995. So this is going to be my 24th time that I've taken students to Japan to study the history of the atomic bombings and the nuclear arms race. I direct the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. And my expertise is mostly nuclear history. And so, but the American understanding is that as Obama goes to Hiroshima and he says, World War II reached its brutal end in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nonsense. That's saying that the atomic bombs ended the war, and therefore the atomic bombing was justified, which most Americans, well, not, the latest poll in 2016 showed that most Americans thought that the atomic bombing was not justified, but that was the first time we've ever come up with that. The reality of the atomic bombing, of course, is that the atomic bombs did not end the war. What ended the war, as American intelligence had been saying over and over again for months, was the Soviet invasion. Once the Soviets intervened into Manchuria and into the uh, Japanese islands, that the, uh, that the Japanese would surrender. The Americans knew that. Truman knew that. Truman re refers to the intercepted July 18th telegram 
He causes the telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. Truman and everybody around him knew the Japanese were desperate to surrender, were trying to find acceptable surrender terms. They, inter they got, try to get the Soviets to intervene on their behalf to get them better surrender terms. Truman says he went to Potsdam to make sure that the Soviets were coming in. And at Potsdam, Stalin on Jul July 16th assures Truman that the Soviets are coming in on schedule. And Truman writes in his diary that night, Stalin will be entering the Jap war by August 16th, August 15th, finny Japs when that occurs. He writes home to his wife, Bess, the next day, saying the Russians are coming in, we'll end the war a year sooner now. Think of all the boys who won't be killed. So then Truman goes ahead and uses the atomic bomb, knowing it wasn't necessary. In fact, the United States had eight five-star admirals and generals in 1945. Seven of the eight are on record saying the atomic bombings were militarily unnecessary, morally reprehensible, or both. General MacArthur says that if we told the, so they told the Japanese they could keep their emperor, they would have surrendered in May. Months earlier, it would have saved thousands and thousands of lives. But Truman used it. And as the question becomes, the second big myth, why does the U.S. use it? To speed up the end of the war? Nonsense. We had other ways to end the war much sooner. We used it because we were sending a message to the Soviets of what would happen if they interfered with the U.S. plans for hegemony in Asia or Europe. And it's exactly how the Soviets interpreted it. Because the Soviets, the Japanese had been meeting with the Soviets, with Soviet ambassador Malik in Tokyo, who wrote back to the Kremlin saying that the Japanese are desperate to surrender. Stalin knew that, the Soviet leaders knew that. And they knew that when the bomb was dropped, they interpreted it as if Japan was not the target, but the Soviet Union was the target. And so the beginning of the Cold War, again, is wrapped in these shrouded in myths. The third basic myth was that the Cold War began during World War II because of Soviet aggression and Soviet territorial aggrandizement. That's not what had started the Cold War. The last telegram that Roosevelt sent to Churchill before he died said that these issues between us and the Soviets come up every day. We shouldn't make a big deal of them. They all get resolved and go away. Roosevelt was sure that the US and the Soviets would have peace together in the post-war period. The person who should have been president to replace him on April 12, 1945, was Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace, who's written out of history now, was the American vice president from 41 to 45. He was the most progressive American leader we've ever had. And when, when in 1942, when, or 1941, when Henry Luce, the head of the Time Life Empire, says that the 20th century must be the American century, the US will dominate the world in every way, Wallace countered that with a speech saying, the 20th century must become the century of the common man. He said, we must end economic imperialism, colonialism, economic exploitation, spread the fruits of science and democracy around the world, raise the standard of living, a global new deal. And so they went after Wallace. Even though on the start of the Democratic Convention, July 20th, 1944, Gallup released a poll of Democratic voters asking who they wanted on the ticket as vice president, 65% said they wanted Wallace back. 2% said so they wanted Truman. So how did Truman get the nomination and become president of the United States? It's a tragic story. If we had more time, I'll go into more detail if there are questions. But from that, that's the real turning point. And, and Truman, I mean, Wallace believed in friendship between the US and the Soviet Union and would have fought and did fight for that as a member of Truman's cabinet until, until September of 1946, when he was finally ousted for criticizing Truman's warmongering policies at the start of the Cold War. So Truman's first day in office is April 13th. By April 23rd, he meets with Molotov, the Soviet foreign minister, and he starts lecturing Molotov and saying, you've broken all your agreements at Yalta. Molotov says, I've never been talked to that way in my life. Truman says, stop breaking your agreements. You won't have to be talked to that way. Truman was wrong on everything he accused Molotov of. But he went out afterwards and he bragged, I gave it to him one, two to the jaw. This is the start of the nightmare that we've seen that was the Cold War. What I was planning initially to do is start my talk, um, not with any of this, but to start with Vladimir Putin's 
speech on March 1st, 19, March 1st, 2018. Putin made a very important speech to the nation on March 1st, in which Putin announced that Russia has five new nuclear weapons, all of which can circumvent America's ballistic missile defense systems. Truman, I mean, Putin said that the new Russian weapons, their hypersonic glide weapons, their nuclear-powered, nuclear-armed cruise missiles, their nuclear torpedoes that can render America's port cities uh, in, uninhabitable for decades, have now made America's missile defense obsolete. And if we look at the history, the more recent history, beginning in 2000, so Putin takes office in 2000, the United States, Charles Krauthammer, the neocon par excellence, who died two weeks ago in the United States, the brains behind the neocons, announced in 1990, before the decline of the Soviet Union, he said that the United States has now become the world's unipolar nation. He said, this is, we've started the, this is the unipolar moment. He says, nobody can challenge us. He says the unipolar moment might last 30 or 40 years. And then in 2002 and 2003, Krauthammer revisited it. And he said that the unipolar, he said, I underestimated the strength of American hegemony. He said the unipolar, it's not a unipolar moment that will last 30 or 40 years of America's complete domination. It's the unipolar era. It will last into the indefinite future. This is the way the neocons were thinking. And what they wrote in the, in the defense planning guidance in 1992, and then was enshrouded in the project for the new American century in 1997, the neocons who pushed for war with Iraq. What they said is that if any nation rises up that can challenge the United States in any region, or any country develops weapons of mass destruction, the United States cannot tolerate that. The United States has to can dominate, control the entire world. And so Krauthammer announces a unipolar era that will last indefinitely. It lasted about two years, according to Krauthammer. When the head of the Arab League said that the gates of hell are open in Iraq now, in 2004, the America unipolar era had already ended. And in 2005, Krauthammer says, I was wrong. The unipolar era is, is not going to happen, and the unipolar moment is now being threatened. So the important change, so we've got Russia's ascendancy with their new weapon systems. We've got China's ascendancy with the One Belt, One Road program, which incorporates, encompasses 65% of the world's population. And they're building, they have an economic plan that's absolutely astounding. China's rise has been unprecedented in history. Up to 1973, there was a 6% rise per year. Since then, after that, there was a 10% rise per year. And that they, are, they are, will soon surpass the United States. So the question becomes, how will the United States adjust to this new multipolar era? How will American hegemony, so the danger is that the United States has lost its moral authority we look at uh, Donald Trump. I, I do a lot of speaking around the world, and I went to the most obscure parts of India uh, a few months ago. And I would go out to places where I was the first foreigner they had ever met. Small colleges, uh, two hours out of Nagpur. They'd never met a foreigner before. And as soon as I mentioned Donald Trump, all these kids in the audience, all the college students would start laughing. America's moral authority is, is uh, as there was recently a Gallup poll that was issued asking about world leadership. And the last year of Obama, 48% of people around the world said that the United States uh, approved of, thought positively of America's leadership. By the first year of the Trump administration, that, that number had dropped by 18 points to 30%, thought of America's leadership in positive terms. The negatives were skyrocketing. The United States came behind Russia, behind China. Germany was the country that now came in first 
in that regard. So uh, Ambassador Ford has pointed out to a couple things that Trump says that are good. And, and I think, yes, his policy toward Russia is probably better until it blows up. His policy toward Korea, you now he created the crisis with Korea. It was a crisis of his own making. And then he made some steps to improve things. But the reality, and I don't want to talk for too long, so uh, we can get into that in discussion. But now we're headed again on a collision path with Korea because of Trump's incompetence and ineptitude. And the absurdity of making a deal, of thinking he could make a deal with Korea when he was tearing up the Iran nuclear deal, which was better than he's ever going to get with anything with Korea. In fact, the Trump people wanted to get Korea off the table so they could move toward war with it, Iran. The Iran deal now is history, and we are the people in Trump's administration, even before Bolton and Pompeo were in those positions, were all Iranophobes, all itchy for war with Iran, and Bolton has called explicitly for attacking Iran. So the, the situation is extremely dangerous. The United States faces a serious, dangerous confrontation with Russia in the Ukraine, in Syria, and in the Baltics. With the NATO expansion in the Baltics, with four new divisions being in there, the British heading up one of those divisions, and then the Russians putting nuclear-capable Iskander missiles into Kaliningrad on the other side, that situation is very, very dangerous. And people are not backing down to the United States now. That's why I wanted to start with Putin's March 1st speech, because what that says and what the Chinese are saying in the South China Sea and elsewhere is that they won't be cowed by the United States and that they're willing to militarily, if necessary, confront the United States. And that's the danger we face. Because the nuclear situation is real. The latest findings of the nuclear experts is that a limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan, in which 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons were used, would lead to partial nuclear winter and up to two billion people being killed by the effects of nuclear winter. A limited war with 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons. But well, we now have 14,000 nuclear weapons between seven and 80 times the size of the weapons used at Hiroshima. The latest Korean test was a North Korean test was a bomb that was 17 times as powerful as the Hiroshima weapon. The United States and the Russians have between us 93% of the world's nuclear weapons. So these kinds of confrontations cannot be tolerated. We need the United States to sit down with Putin. That's a good thing. We need to work together, resolve these crises, because they're all much too dangerous. So there's a lot more I'd like to say, but we'll open it, leave it for discussion. Uh, but it's a very dangerous world now. When the bulletin atomic scientists move the hands of the doomsday clock back to two minutes before midnight on, in January, the closest we've been since the 1950s, they knew what they were talking about. The world is much more dangerous than it was in 2012, in 2014. And now this, and the question is, how will the U.S. adjust to this new multipolarity? Is the United States going to try to maintain hegemony? If it does, then our future is probably pretty bleak. If the United States could be forced to adjust, then maybe we still have some hope for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Peter Kuznick, for that wonderful and insightful speech there. And I would also like to thank Peter specifically because he's a very busy man and he maybe 200 plus interviews per year and speaking tours around the world. And Peter uh, asked for no fee for coming here and taking part in this five day imperialism on trial tour. And, you know, it is a wonderful addition to our team here. So I'd like to give Peter a specific. Thank you. Thank you.